Hey everybody, welcome back to the Revelation Bible Study. My name is David Kenny, and I'm the pastor of Walden Community Church here in Montgomery, Texas. And we are going through the entire book of Revelation. That's right, the entire book of Revelation on YouTube in small, tiny, little bite-sized chunks. And we're doing that just so that it's easy to digest, we don't do too much, we're able to just process and take in uh, exactly what we read, you know, and we can always go back and re-watch something if we forget or it slips our mind. We're starting off in Revelation chapter 5 right now. Uh, we've gotten that far. We're right at the beginning. So if you want to, you can go back and watch the previous videos or you can just start right here and read along with us. And Revelation 5 is so uh, important, I think, because it's, it's, it's exactly what we are going through right now. I'm recording this in the year 2020 and uh, it's still... COVID season and it's back to school and numbers in America still don't look great. Still not where we want it to be. We're right before a presidential election and I think uh, people on both sides of the line would say that uh, things look grim. Things look bleak. Uh, someone even asked me at the dentist if I thought we were living in end times because of everything that's going on in the world. They said, do you believe that we're living in end times. And I, I guess it's because there just seems to be that much going on, you know, that much heartache, that much trouble. Uh, California is currently on fire, right? And we know that there will be pain and trouble and struggle in the world because of sin, right? Uh, God has allowed sin, God has allowed the devil to still have an influence in the world and we just assume that all those things are going to get worse before they get better. You know, the Bible calls Satan the God of this world. He's referred to in another place as the God of this age. And so I think people nowadays are asking the same questions as when John wrote Revelation. You know, John wrote Revelation during Roman occupation, during a time when Romans were persecuting Christians, killing Christians. And it was tough for them too. And I would argue a lot tougher for them than it is for us. You know, we don't know what it's like to live uh, being constantly persecuted for our faith, uh, having it be illegal, being killed, hunted for our faith. We don't know what that's like. And, and, and people back then were wondering, okay, when is this gonna stop? When is the persecution gonna stop? When is it gonna be over? When will, be re, when will we all be redeemed, right? When is this all gonna end? And we would ask the same question now. We would say, you know, when is, when is 2020 finally going to be over, right? When, when are all the heartaches and pain going to stop? When, when can we get back to life as normal? Or even looking to an even much brighter future, when is Jesus coming again, right? When is the second coming? When is the resurrection? Revelation 5 is so crucial, I think, because of those questions and such a great chapter for us to start. Revelation 5 verse 1 says, Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Now remember, John's in the throne room of God. He's still there. The scenery hasn't changed. So what we read in Revelation 4, same here in Revelation 5. He's just noticing that the one on the throne holds a scroll. And the scroll has seven seals. Now, what, what, what's the deal with that? Well, a seal would be a wax stamp, right, that was put on the outside to indicate that the contents of the scroll were private. And any normal document between two people would probably have a single seal. Legal documents, important legal documents, uh, like maybe the possession of land or property, right, or your birthright, this is your inheritance, it would have to have seven witnesses to the transaction, to the, to the signing of the document, and then each one of those witnesses would put their seal on it. So this being a seal with seven seals indicates that this is a legal document. This is binding. This is important. There's no document uh, with more seals. There's no documents that are more important. So this is the title deed of the earth. This scroll. The scroll that God hands in his, that has in his hands. This is, this is ownership of our planet. Right? And he holds it. And in verse 2, it says, And I saw a mighty angel proclaim with a loud voice, Who is worthy 
to open the scroll and break its seals. And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And we would ask, okay, why, why is John crying? Like, is he so interested in what's inside? Like, does he really want to see what's inside so, and, and to read it? Like, if someone told him it was story time and they said, oh, we can't open the book, sorry. And then he starts to cry. No. Remember, the scroll has writing on the outside and the inside. So because there's writing on the outside, John knows what's on the inside. The writing on the outside says what this scroll is. So John knows that the one who can open that scroll is the one who can redeem the world. And that's what he wants. He wants redemption. He wants salvation. He wants the end of suffering. And so whoever opens that scroll is going to be the Messiah, the Redeemer of the world. And when no one is found who can open it, John cries because he said, you know what? The suffering will continue. It'll never stop. We'll continue to be persecuted. People will continue to die. So he's weeping because there is no Messiah to be found. And in verse 5, it all changes. It says, one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. But there is someone. John was crying because there was no one to be found, but there is someone, someone who can break the seal, someone who can claim the ownership of the earth, and it's Jesus. Jesus, who is the rod of Jesse. This elder comes over and lays a hand on John and says, John, don't, don't cry. The game isn't over. You know, we're not down for the count. It may be 20 to nothing on the scoreboard, but we got one more play. Why does the lamb have seven horns and seven eyes? Well, seven is the number of perfection, okay? So it's a complete number. And horns on a lamb would make it a ram, right? A male. And to have seven horns would be seven strengths or seven power. So it's a way of saying that this lamb is all powerful, okay? And because he has seven eyes, that means he's all seeing, all knowing. So he's omniscient and all powerful, right? These are these are what we would these are titles of God, right? God is all powerful and all knowing. So this is that's that's the only reason. And now this lamb is going to break the seals and redeem the earth, which means now there'll be no more pain on the earth, no more there'll be no more disease, no more death. And so that this elder taps John on the shoulder and says, "Look, here comes Jesus with perfect strength and perfect power." Verse 7 says, And he went and took the scroll from, my right, from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. What a scene. You know, at first, nobody's worthy. Nobody was worthy. The world was doomed. John cries big buckets of tears, right? And then, in the bottom of the ninth, base is loaded. Jesus steps forward. He grabs the scroll. And then the entire room of God falls down and worships him. It's incredible. What an incredible scene. What about us? What do we do? You know, if John looks around the throne room and he says, we need a savior. And Jesus steps forward and says, that's me. I'm ready to go. Put me in coach. I'm ready to play. Right? That means Jesus could return at any moment. Doesn't have to be a bad year. Doesn't have to be a, a time when Things look dark and gloom. Jesus can return at any moment, at any time. So what about us? What should you and I be doing? If the lamb has grabbed the scroll and he's on his way, what should we do? Well, we should be ready to go, right? I mean, let me ask you, if if Jesus came back today, would you be ready to go with him? I don't mean, uh, are you saved? Or uh, do you think you're, worthy to go. I'm saying, are you ready to go? Are you ready to go? If Christ came back in this moment, would there be anything in your life that you would feel was, 
embarrassing or that you are ashamed of or something that you didn't resolve yet, you just haven't gotten around to it, or if there's an action right now in your life that you're not proud of, and Jesus is going to come back right now and he's going to catch you in the middle of that action. Is that what you want to be doing when Christ returns? You know, if Christ can return at any moment, that should cause us to really change the way we live. It should really change the way we think about what we do with our time. And I would say, you know, if you're not living in a way that's pleasing to God right now, his return might come as an incredible shock to you. We should live as though Christ could return today. Not look down the road and go, ah, he's not coming. We shouldn't live our lives that way. We shouldn't live our lives like nobody's watching. We should live our lives like he is watching every day. And, and second, we should be looking forward to it, right? Not only living like he could come, but second, looking forward to his coming. Not embarrassed that he could come today, but anxious, excited that he could come today. Wake up every day with your bags packed, ready to go, anxious. Second Peter 3 says, You ought to live holy and godly lives. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. 1 John 3, 3 says, Everyone who hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. If you are looking forward to his return, that's going to impact you in a big, huge way, and it should cause you to live a godly life. The Bible says, be holy just as he is holy. So if your question is, what should we do in the meantime? That's what you should do in the meantime. Hey, thanks for watching, guys. I love you. I'll see you next time. Bye.